Welcome to the Tudors Dynasty podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Welcome to the show. As many of you may already know, King Henry VIII is my favorite monarch from the Tudor dynasty. If it wasn't for his reign, I don't believe that the Tudors would be as popular as they are today. With the creation of Showtime's The Tudors, many of us who were aware of the name Henry VIII but didn't really know much about him were able to see that there was more to the man than the execution of two of his six wives. While I understand the Tudors TV program had a bunch of historical inaccuracies, it also got a lot of people, like myself, to look deeper into their history by reading and absorbing as much as we possibly could. Over a decade later, I feel like I have a fairly good grasp on the infamous king and would like to share my understanding of him with you. Henry VIII was a man, well, maybe a man-child, but he wasn't just the tyrannical ruler that many see him as today there was much more to him than most understand. I hope with this series on his life that you will look at Henry through new eyes. Before we dive into this episode, I need to take a minute to talk a bit about the show. If you're new to my podcast and found me on iTunes, you're missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before the ones that you see on there. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click on posts. I also have a link to them on TudorsDynasty.com in the menu. Just click on podcasts. If you find me on iTunes, I'd also love to see some more five-star ratings and comments there. The more reviews, the higher I'll be on the recommendation list for Tudor lovers. And who doesn't like to hear how great they are? (laughs) Speaking of Patreon, I need to take a moment to thank my existing patrons. Jessica, Robert, Peggy, Kim, Kathy, Katie, Rachel H., Diane, Joy, Lynn, James, Rachel D., Lacey, Angela, Azaria, Alithia, Anne, Maria, Cynthia, Lisa, Stacy, Nora, Wendy, Frankie, Ramey, Catherine, Carrie, Jen, Heather, Cheryl, Mary, Nicole, Tanya, Astra, Melissa, and my newest patron, Diana E. Thank you so much. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to continue with these podcasts. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like I stated previously, a special thank you to my newest patron, Diana E. Diana, I can't thank you enough for joining this group of amazing people. Thank you so much. I am truly grateful for all of your generosity. It's not only my podcast that you support, but also my website, TutorsDynasty.com, which started in June of 2015 as Tutors Weekly. This was a paperly account where I was able to share all kinds of tutor-related topics with those who found my page. A few months into it, I realized that I had ideas of articles I wished to write, but I never considered myself a writer. I really only knew that I loved the Tudor era. With the support and encouragement of my husband, he convinced me to start writing. He said... The more you write, the better you'll get. I wasn't sure if he was right, and I was terrified of the reaction that I would get from social media, but I did it anyway. And I was pleasantly surprised by the response I received. At the beginning, there weren't critics who picked apart my articles or scolded me for bad grammar. That didn't come until later when more people discovered my site. In 2016, I decided to switch the name from Tudors Weekly to Tudors Dynasty. I was posting more articles than once a week, and using Dynasty seemed to convey more of what I was doing. It has stuck, and now I'm known as such on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. But let's be honest, if you want to stay in contact with me and see more social media posts, it will be on Facebook. I also recently started a Facebook group for TutorsDynasty.com. With the new algorithm on Facebook, you're not seeing my Tutors Dynasty Facebook page as much in your feed. Facebook has stated that they are going to show more groups and more family and friends. So I have created a group as well, and I'm sharing all the same posts that are on the page to the group. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of my posts, be sure to find the TutorsDynasty.com group and join. Now back to all the wonderful patrons. Just so you know, all the money received from the patrons go right back into the show, the cost of running my website, and research materials, including subscriptions to those hidden or hard-to-find documents. Believe it or not, I do have a full-time day job, and this is something that I do in my ever-decreasing downtime. 
Creating a podcast can easily take 15 hours a week, something that my husband is sometimes not so keen about, but it's my passion and he supports me. He might not also understand why I'm so obsessed with the tutors, but then again, I don't understand some of his passions either. If you would like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. Lastly, it's been a while since I've given an update on my dad. He's been home now since March and is still healing. We're hoping someday in the near future that he can be fitted for a prosthetic and will be able to walk again. As a retired dairy farmer, it's very difficult for him not to be outside taking care of what remains of the farmstead. He's struggling a bit, but we are very grateful that he's still here with us. Thank you to all of you who sent prayers and well wishes during the months that he was hospitalized this past winter. It was truly the most difficult thing my entire family has been through. Thanks again for all of your support. Now, let's get on with the show. Sit back, relax, close your eyes, and prepare to be transported back in time to Tudor, England. As many of you already know, Henry VIII is my favorite of the Tudor monarchs. Henry ruled England from 1509 until his death on the 28th of January, 1547. As the second son of King Henry VII, Young Henry was not expected to become King of England, and so he was sent to Eltham Palace to be raised with his sisters. While at Eltham, Henry would have most likely had constant contact with his mother, Elizabeth of York. When you consider Henry's relationship with women in his life, one must wonder if he was constantly on the search for a woman like his own mother. Elizabeth of York had a great influence on her son and may have helped educate her children during her lifetime. Born at Greenwich Palace on the 28th of June, 1491, Henry Tudor was the third child and second son of King Henry VIII and Elizabeth of York. His parents' marriage had put an end to the decades of fighting between the Yorks and the Lancasters in what we know as the Wars of the Roses. For the most part, Henry's childhood would have been idyllic, but not without occasional bits of drama. The fact that Henry's father claimed the throne on the battlefield against Richard III did not sit well with the supporters of the Lancasters. And, for that matter, the Yorks were not pleased either. In 1487, a young man named Lambert Simnel was coerced to play the part of Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick, to raise arms against the new Tudor king, Henry VII. At the same time, the real Edward Plantagenet was sitting in the tower, and it didn't take long before Simnel was discovered as a pretender. At some point around 1494, Perkin Warbeck came on the scene. The reason I say 1494 is because in 1494, young Prince Henry was given by his father the title of Lieutenant of Ireland. This would not be the last time that Henry VII gave a title to his second son in an attempt to show control. In 1495, Warbeck took 14 ships funded by his supposed aunt, Margaret of York, along with 6,000 men across the Channel to England in hope that he could claim the throne of England. Things didn't quite turn out the way that he had planned, and he and his men fled to Ireland. Before long, they had moved to Scotland, where Warbeck gained the assistance of King James IV of Scotland. Warbeck was claiming to be one of the lost princes in the tower, the younger of the two brothers, Richard, Duke of York. Many believe that he was truly the young prince and that the throne of England should be his by right. Henry VII would not have another pretender using a title that was meant for his son, and in 1494, three-year-old Prince Henry was titled as Duke of York. There could not be two, and Henry, at the moment, was the true title holder, not Warbeck. At a young age, Henry would have known that a monarch's throne is never 100% secure. It also must have been a bit confusing for him and his sisters to understand that some of their mother's family wanted to remove their father. Everything changed in April 1502 when Henry's older brother, Arthur, died unexpectedly at Ludlow Castle. Henry went from a mostly carefree childhood to a life that led to him being overly protected as sole heir to the throne of England. Gone were the days when he could run freely and have unrestricted fun to feeling like a prisoner of his father's. 
Henry had been betrothed to Catherine of Aragon in 1503. He was 12 years old. As stated previously, Henry's life, once Prince of Wales, was thoroughly controlled by his father, the king. The betrothal to the Dowager Princess of Wales was something that would evolve with the ever-changing politics of the day. While his brother Arthur had been, practically from birth, trained in the ways of kingship, Henry's training did not begin until he was 11 years old. The young Prince of Wales was not used to the rigorous training that he received to prepare himself for the throne, and he only had seven years to cram for the biggest role of his life. At Richmond Palace on the 21st of April, 1509, King Henry VII died. He was 52 years old. His son, who was only 18 years old, was now King of England. When he came to the throne, Henry VIII was described as exceptionally tall, well-proportioned, had the features of a Greek god, and moved gracefully. His complexion was fair, had auburn hair, and a rounded face with features so delicately formed that they would become a pretty woman. This new young king naturally commanded attention and authority by appearance alone. Henry had always been fascinated by Catherine. She was beautiful and he was enchanted by her. After the death of his father, Henry decided that he would marry Catherine of Aragon and he would claim it was his father's wish on his deathbed. The couple were married six weeks after Henry's accession at the chapel of the Franciscan Observance at Greenwich. Henry would also be quoted as writing to her father, Ferdinand of Aragon, that if I were still free, I would still choose her for a wife before all other. They would have a double coronation or crowning 13 days later on Midsummer Day, 24th of June, 1509. It was the coronation that set the tone for Henry's reign. It was the beginning of the Renaissance period in England. It had also been a long time since a king came to the throne with such approval and adoration. It was a new era, one of education, music, jousting, and overall fun. The court was full of young people, which was the opposite of the reign of his father. Henry was eager to open his father's coffers, which were overflowing, by the way, to celebrate his new role. Lord Montjoy wrote to Erasmus only weeks after Henry's accession and had this to say, quote, If you could see how everyone here rejoices in having so great a prince, how his life is all their desire, you would not contain yourself for sheer joy. Extortion is put down, liberality scatters riches with a bountiful hand, yet our king does not set his heart on gold or jewels, but on virtue, glory, and immortality. The other day he told me, quote, I wish I were more learned, but learning is not what we expect of a king, I answered, merely that he should encourage scholars. Most certainly, he rejoined, as without them, we should scarcely live at all. Now, what more splendid remark could a prince make? William Roper, the son-in-law of Thomas More, also remembered how the young king was eager to learn. He recalled how More and the king would discuss astronomy, geometry, divinity, and other worldly affairs all hours of the night. Henry truly enjoyed conversing with More and enjoyed learning from him and having discussions with him as well. Henry VIII wasn't always the tyrannical monarch who would execute you if you looked at him wrong. At the beginning of his reign, he relented to public outcry against his father's tax collectors, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. While the public wanted to see the men put away, Henry was eager to spend the fruits of their labor. The mood at Tudor court had changed drastically since the changing of the guard. Now there was laughter in the corridors at court and continuous festivals to enjoy. Under the new administration, both highborn and lowborn men had the same opportunities. While Henry understood the importance of having men of noble birth and experience in key positions, he also appreciated men of ambition, like Thomas Wolsey, a man who would soon become pseudo king. That's where we'll end part one of this series on Henry VIII. Next episode, we'll continue on with the story of life of Henry VIII and understanding him a bit better. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Until next time. <laughs>